get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have, when I say extremely impressive entrepreneur and intrapreneur, that's an understatement. You could look him up on Wikipedia to prove it, but Jay Samet is a leading technology innovator who's raised over $800 million for startups. He sold companies to Fortune 500 firms, taking companies public. He's partnered with some of the world's biggest brands like Coca-Cola, Microsoft, Apple, just to name a few. And everyone from the Pope to the president to LinkedIn call on Jay to orchestrate innovation. He's also built global divisions for Universal Studios, EMI, and Sony. And he's the author of Disrupt You, Master, Master Personal Transformation, Seize Opportunity, and Thrive in the Era of Endless Innovation. Hold that up again, Jay. Thank you so much. For joining me good morning pleasure to be here so i have so many questions i always like to include a fun fact but i want to talk about the book you know how'd you choose that cover show me the cover for a second because i thought it was interesting you have the blue fish going the opposite way and then the, tell me about that so what you really want to do is you need something to pop at retail and yeah. you need a graphic that tells a story it's like yeah. launching any brand yeah. and when you talk about personal transformation you know, what's a symbol of that? And so many of us expect to get success by following what others have done, and yet no one leads by following a path. Mm. So it's about going the opposite direction. It's about understanding changes of current. And so the fish that goes the wrong direction, that seemed to be, or as I like to say, only dead fish go with the current. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, you know, and I want to get into some of your great stories from the book. It's fantastic. I listened to it one and a half times. And, but I want to ask a few questions first. Like, why, You're a busy executive. You have a million yeah. things going on. What made you write the book? It's my way of paying it forward. So I'm no different than anybody else. Um, my success was just refusing to give up. Yeah. And when I talked to the whole bunch of friends that became billionaires and built all these companies that now everybody thinks about, we were no different. We weren't better educated, better connected. We weren't part of what was supposed to be, you know, taking over the world. Mm -hmm. And I give back by teaching uh, a college course on how to build a high tech startup. And I realized here were these really bright minds that had never been exposed to how you really disrupt an industry, how you really change. And everybody always talks about wanting to change the world, but most people don't want to admit it starts with changing yourself. Right, right. And on that front, you know, I always like to include a fun fact that most people don't know about you. And in the book, you talk a little bit about this, but a personal about yourself, transformation, innovation, you had the goal of doing trapeze. Why and, and how did you accomplish that goal? So one of the things that I talk about is in when you do self-disruption, it's, it's akin to doing plastic surgery, but you hold the scalpel, you have to really see what's holding you back. And for many people, they were told they're not good at math, they're not good at this, and that's all BS, and we have the cognitive research in, in there that you can become anything. Mm -hmm. But there's a thing called the Matthew effect mm -hmm. uh, from, from the, the Bible, uh, those that have much, much will be given, which shows that those that are told that they're good at something will spend more time in it and become good at it. Right, right. Um, so athletes become good at it, whatever. But there's the reverse effect. So my mom forged my birth certificate to get me in school a year early. Mm. Um, came from good intentions. Uh, but that meant I was always the smallest kid, the weakest kid. And so from day one yeah. at four years old, I'm bad at sports. Right. I was so bad at sports that I did not like the concept of sports. Right. I grew up with this. I'm lousy at sports. I don't watch any games. I don't follow anything. I know nothing about that part of it. So when I came to the realization, here I am successful here, I've disrupted you know, telecommunications and fast food and automotive and all these industries, but I wasn't honest with myself. And mm -hmm. when I said, what baggage was I still carrying, mm -hmm. I was still four years old say, and I'm now six feet one, but still saying I can't compete. Mm. So I said, okay, when I turn 40, I'm going to be an athlete. What mm. would be something 
that I'd want to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm one of those guys that always like the circus and always like those type of things. So I tried to pick something as athletic as a person of 40 could do. And I decided I was going to learn how to do trapeze and (laughs) fly through the air. And not only did I do that, but the other thing which is uh, that I did that I didn't even know how amazing it would be. Yeah. Have you ever seen, it's called teeterboard. One guy stands on one side of seesaw, the other guy jumps on it to fly in the air mm-hmm, and, yeah. and he catches it. So I was that human, you know, uh, juggling pin. It, it was the coolest moment of my life because you actually don't have to do anything except not panic. The guy who's catching you is doing all the hard work and the guy who's jumping and making you go. But as long as you don't panic, you're the guy up in the air doing the cool thing. So so the, the proof of it was similar to, you know, Tony Robbins telling people the gimmick of walking on fire or whatever. Mm-hmm. You're limitless. The yeah. only limitations you're putting on yourself or your career yeah. are you. So get those other voices out of your head and disrupt use all about how to go through that. Yeah. And once you figure out how to do that, you can do that with any industry. Right. So how did you get the voices out of your head? Because that's not easy if you – it's ingrained in you since four that you're not an athlete and you – can't compete and you can't get in shape. What did you do mentally and physically at that time to 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 accomplish that goal? I guess. So at the time, I was president of the world's largest uh, record company, EMI, yeah. and I had a guy working for me who was on the Olympic wrestling team. Mm. And his problem was he could never medal because he couldn't put on enough weight, like the most bizarre thing that you've ever heard, because he. For weight, him was muscle. Right. And he, w- he would eat whole jars of peanut butter every day. And da-da. So I said, listen, I had a doctor's note out of PE since I was like eight. <laughs> give me, you know, give me a list of 20 exercises right. and that would do every part of my body. Yeah. And I and part of changing is making a commitment. Not a I'll try, right. not a I might. I will do. Th-. So I committed that I would do these exercises twice a week. Not a big commitment. Right. First time I did it, I was knocked out for a day and a half, went back later in the week, and eventually got that it was 40 minutes that it took, and mm. suddenly weight came off me, muscle came on, yeah. and I suddenly felt like what an athlete feels like. Yeah, yeah. So it was huge to go to, almost like someone should just go to a mentor who's done it and have them boil well, down what, what they should be doing. And that's part of the secret of success in business. Yeah. There are mentors waiting to help anybody become yeah. successful in any field. You can find them on LinkedIn. You can reach out. It's not, hey, I saw you on LinkedIn. Will you mentor me? It's, hey, I saw that you have expertise in this area. I want to ask you a question. Right. And start that dialogue. And everybody would like to help the next generation because it validates that we feel like we've accomplished something in our lives. Yeah, yeah. So who do you consider your mentors throughout um, probably the most influential, and, and because he's so modest and so quiet, he's, he's hardly mentioned in the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, Richard Branson had a partner from day one named Ken Barry. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the most interesting and humble guys you'll ever meet, that, who really just showed me a different way of interacting with people mm-hmm. in success. So what did he show you? What was it? Um, well, the joke that people used to say is when Ken would fire somebody, they'd leave his office saying, you're right, Ken, this isn't the place for me. Now is the time for me to get on with my life and do something. Uh, it was just, to, you know, there's no one sentence. It was just to his yeah. manner of, of, of doing it. But when he recruited me to try to transform the music industry from selling round things to digital downloads and subscriptions and Steve Jobs and all the different things that, that we accomplished, I said to him, I'm not a music guy. I don't know anything about your industry. And he said, I got 11,000 music guys. What I don't have is a future. And so mm-hmm. I would try something. And anytime I would have a hit a brick wall, I don't know how to get past it. I don't know what I'm doing. He was the kind of boss that you could go to and solve for. Yeah. So I embodied that in when I manage people and I run a public company, as you know now. Yeah. And I give them two rules when you come work for me. The first is, you don't work for me, I work for you. Hmm. Your job is to tell me what you need to succeed. If I get it for you, then it's on you. If you don't ask me or tell me what you need, then you're not doing it. Hmm. And the second one, which freaks out a certain type of person, is if you work for me for a year and you don't make a mistake, I will fire you. Right. And I'm religious about this because everything that you're doing is trying to try things that weren't tried before. And if you can't overcome your fear of failing, 
Yeah. And that's the big mistake. Failing is not failure. Failing is trying something and finding out it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Failure is throwing in the towel and say, woe is me. Yeah. You know, Bill Gates and Paul Allen's first company went bankrupt. Walt Disney's first three companies went bankrupt. Henry yeah. Ford's first three companies went bankrupt. You know, it's about getting back on that horse and learning what mm-hmm. not to do again. Right. That takes us back to your early days. And okay. there was a, a kiosk. Talk ah. about that. That is, a, you know, quote unquote, learning failure story. Yeah. So what's interesting about that story is you probably didn't, well, the audio book, they wouldn't have it, but there's a footnote in that story. So I'll tell you the footnote okay. because yeah. it would have diverged in the story. So the short version is, um, I made the first, what was called a uh, player activated lottery machine. You walk up, you touch the screen. This is before there were touch screens. This was like cutting edge 1980s. Yeah. You touch the screen and it prints out your ticket. And we were running in a bunch of states and we were going up for the California lottery, the biggest lottery, the biggest state. We had the best machine. The other guy's thing was a little, you know, green, green numbers on a, on a black screen. You know, the back when computers only yes. had one color. Yes. You look at the two, it's like, do you want the Rolls Royce or do you want the rickshaw? I mean, that was the difference. And what I didn't know is the FBI had secretly videotaped the state senator making this decision, getting a briefcase of $50,000 in cash. Wow. And his name was Senator Allen Robbins. He went to jail. But he awarded the guys that gave him the bribe. They got the contract. I didn't they see did. that. That wasn't in the audio. Yeah. Yeah, that's in, that's a no. They didn't overturn the contract when they caught him for taking a bribe. Mm. Right. So they got the contract. Here I had this great machine. I thought I was going to make a fortune. This was going to be my mark in life. And I'm coming home dejected. Like I put every dollar I had into this and tried everything. Right. I'm in my early 20s. Why did I fail? Why am I a failure? Oh my God. And I'm thinking about this machine. And I land at LAX. And this is when I'm like every penny counts. Um, I'm young a young father struggling, and I'm trying to figure out how to get a van home from the airport. And back then they had live volunteer women that sat for a few hours a day and told you how to do this or that. There's nobody there. There's nothing going on. And I go, wait a second. Look at all these people. 50 million people go through this airport. They speak all kinds of languages, and there's no way to do anything or get a ticket. or do. You have to wait on a person. Right. What if I take this kiosk and turn it into something for airports? And today, when you go through the airport, maybe you'll think of me because... Kies have now replaced tons of jobs. The other footnote on that is at the same time we went to McDonald's and tried to convince them, this is in the 1980s, mm-hmm. that you could that your cash register was basically a touchscreen that had a small soda, medium soda, big soda, because they don't have the most educated workforce. Why not turn it around and make it a kiosk? So you could order your own stuff, get it right, save all those employees, mm-hmm. make tons of profits. Yeah. Nobody hurt. We tried it with the drive through we tried everything, nobody cared. Now that the, the, the U.S. has mandated $15 an hour minimum wage, McDonald's now has kiosks. <laughs> so yeah. the, the problem that people don't realize is 40% of all jobs that presently exist will disappear by 2020. That's mm. only five years That's away. That's amazing. Yeah. So whether you're a manager, whether you're bottom, your career, whether by circumstance or by choice, is yeah. going to get disrupted. Yeah. So you either learn how to turn every obstacle into an opportunity and be yeah. part of the new wave, or you get swept down yeah. and, and lose. Yeah, and that's why this book is so important because whether you are starting your company or you're in a company, either way, you're gonna need to disrupt. Yeah, and, yeah. and, and the mistake of people that are middle-aged are they have a skill set, they've been at one, one company, one career, they know how to do one thing, and all of a sudden Kodak is gone or Lehman's is gone right. or the music industry's gone and they don't know what to do. And at the other side of it, we have 2.3 billion millennials. That is more people in one generation than were on the entire planet when our parents were born. There will not be corporate jobs for 2.3 billion people. So either they learn how to create their own business, they look at what's changed in the world that they can benefit from, and we're living in this era of endless innovation. There is endless opportunity. Every month there's a new self-made 20-year-old billionaire. A billionaire in their 20 is happening monthly. Doesn't that make it feel like you and I have wasted a lot of time? <laughs> um, Don't remind me. Yeah. But you're one click away from six billion consumers. Yeah. You only have to be right for a nanosecond. Yeah. You only have to push once for you to make it to a billion. Yeah. So two questions. You know, what I see people bring up as an obstacle for them uh, mentally is one, 
how do I even come up with something disruptive? And two, once you do, how do you execute on it? Like many people may have an, had an idea for a kiosk or maybe not, but you executed on it. How did you get from walking through having that idea to actually getting it implemented? So, so let, let's break it down in two things. So let's talk about yeah. the idea. Yeah. So most people think an idea is this fully formed, you know, flux capacitor moment that you go, oh, I forgot this figured out. Okay, right. you're Doc Brown. Right. In reality, if you have problems in your life, congratulations, you have a better chance of being successful right. because all that success is is solving for others. Yeah. If you solve for a whole bunch of people, you become very wealthy. Wow. So what are your problems? Well, I was in traffic today. Well, how can I make traffic go away? Well. The phone company knows where my phone is. It's in my car. It also knows that the phone in the other car is in a different car. If we tell one car to go left and the other go to right, that's the basis of Waze. Mm -hmm. Guys stuck in Tel Aviv traffic, so about as far off from Silicon Valley as you could get on the globe. Right. The second part is you don't need to know all the steps in the journey to, to go down your path of disruption. Yeah. You need what the end point is, and you can work back some of the steps, and you'll figure it out. I see, yeah. So implementation, you only need two skills to be successful and to implement anything. Mm -hmm. Drive and persistence. Mm -hmm. Everything else can be hired. So I've been associated for three decades with some of the most cutting edge technology on the planet. First mm -hmm. video on a computer, first yeah. social network, on and on and on. I'm not an engineer. I don't write code. I teach at an engineering, the largest engineering university. Uh, yeah, I saw that. And yeah. I don't read code. So the point is you don't have to know everything. You have to be honest to know what you don't know and what you'd get to market quicker hiring somebody that knows rather than learning it yourself. Yeah. So when you saw that problem in the airport, what did you do to actually – there must have been a million steps in between to get that implemented. Well, one of the stories that, that I talk about in, in the book is I came up with the solution for, for Ford Motor Company, and I'm in my 20s in Los Angeles, mm. don't know anybody in Michigan, anybody in automotive, have no background in, in the auto industry, and I tried to solve for how do, you, how do you get there, and I tried to imagine who is somebody that a top automotive exec would like to meet. Right. It's the Midwest. They all like football, Michigan State. One of the football coaches was retiring. What's he going to do? Mm -hmm. Seek him out. And I hired him as head of sales, though he didn't know anything about computers. They'd go in, talk about the game from this year. Like, What's the kid here for? Okay, here's the business. It really was that simple. So how old were you at the time? 25. Wow. Yeah. Um, and once you crack that code that you can reach anybody, you can make anything happen, it's empowering and you suddenly become limitless. Yeah. It, it's a superpower. Yeah. Knowing how to disrupt. Yeah. And so next, what gave you the idea for, for Jasmine? Ah, so my name is J. Allen Samet and it was mine. So that was the name of the company. So I came out of college, like many kids today, that I did everything I was told. I got the good grades, I got top of my class, I got good test scores, and boom, there's a recession. There's not a job to be had. Yeah. Well, one of the things I don't recommend people doing that I did is I fell in love real young and I had kids real young. And so there I am with mouths to feed and there's no mm. job. So yeah, yeah. I took a dollar and there was one of these ads that for a dollar they'll make you a couple hundred business cards. So I made up a fake company and I went around knowing that I had a computer background and the only other people doing computer effects in Hollywood was a guy named George Lucas in Industrial Light Magic. Okay. A Star little Wars. known name. Yeah. A yeah. little known name. Yeah. Now, with that little no name came mighty big budget and price tag. So I figured if I could be the poor man's ILM for the guy who couldn't afford the big effects, there would be some business out there. But no one's going to hire and believe a 20-something year. But if I work at this mythical company that nobody goes and visits. So one day, uh, so th this took off. We're doing all kinds of stuff. I work for all kinds of clients. And one day, the client wants to see the operation. There's no operation. Um, you farm out everything and you hire bright people to do stuff. Today, we think of business working this way, but back then you had a company in an office. So we went to a prop house and we got those, those fake computer fronts like from mainframes and stuff and, and strung Christmas lights behind them, 
put him behind some smoke glass. That was the, the back room where stuff was doing. So I call him Winky Blink, so all the lights were doing. And, <laughs> and I had all my friends come in and just sit there and look busy and just do something. And, you know, we got millions of dollars worth of business. So what was Jasmine for people who don't know? Uh, we did special effects for movies, and then one day uh, there was a joint venture between Pioneer Electronics in Japan, Universal Studios, and IBM that said, we're going to make an interactive video, video that you can say yes or no in branch. It was called the LaserDisc. So mm -hmm. uh, they said, do you know how to do this? Now, this is something that they spent tens, hundreds of millions of dollars to invent, had no idea what to do with it, mm. and I only asked one question, do you have a budget? And they go, yeah, we have a huge budget. Go, yes. We know how to do it. Um, so the tip for success in Jay's axiom, the, the, Sam, the Samet saying is, be the best in the world at what you do or the only one doing it. Because right. if you're the only one doing it, by definition, you're the best. So I was always the first one in the new thing. And what made me successful wasn't that. It's a certain amount of luck that what you pick as the next new thing turns out to be the next new thing. Yeah. And we talk about how to look at trends and, and, and waves and what those are. Yeah. And with that, when they say that, I mean, you could take that in a million different directions with a laser disc. So what path did you choose? Why, what made you choose that path? So I was convinced it was better. Back then you have Betamax and VHS that just come out. They're growing, grainy. They look like crap in the whole mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. And here's something that never deteriorates, never breaks. You can go from the first minute to the last minute. You can, you can branch. You can do interactive training, storytelling, all this stuff. And I, I couldn't see how this thing could lose. There, there, was, there was no way. Um, turns out I was wrong because they put in the same channel as the other devices that recorded. And this didn't record. And everybody figured, wow, what I really want to do is record. Mm -hmm. But that technology a decade later grew into the CD and the DVD. Mm -hmm. So the lesson there is sometimes you can be absolutely right, but you can't control the timing of the market. Mm -hmm. So then it was who had a problem so big that I could force Laserdisc down their throat to solve it. Mm -hmm. right? And that's what you have to look at. And you can go to university today and see that scientists have spent billions of dollars on research and patents that are just sitting there waiting for a business mm -hmm. person, a yeah. marketeer, to come in and look and say, wait, can I have this product that you spent all this time on? I think I can turn it into something. Yeah, that's a great idea. What was the high point of Jasmine for you? Um, oh, that's a good question. I hate having to think out loud. Um, <laughs> there were so many because it was my first time running a company. With some, I, I would guess... You can, um, you can name a few if they come well, uh, Yeah. So the most, and this sounds like a name dropping thing, but the most out-of-body experience. So yeah. um, make a long story short, I ended up being partnered with the biggest name in, in music, a guy named David Geffen, yeah. for my biggest selling product. Uh, 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 the first video game that had real rock and roll music in it was Breakthrough and all that. And I get a call one day that uh, he was talking with Steven and Steven wants to meet. And I'm like, Steven who? And later he would form a partnership called DreamWorks, so Steven Spielberg. And I'm sitting there, okay, the richest man in the music industry and the richest man in Hollywood have nothing better to do but sit around at night playing a game that I made. And this is cool. I mean, very cool. You know, yeah. you know, you put yourself out there, you create something, and you don't know where it goes. Right. I mean, if you would have told me that I would be sitting with my little software company and the president of the United States would call or that you end up to partnering with the Pope on something, I'd be asking you what you're smoking. But... If you can have a big enough vision, it will attract other people yeah. and you become a Pied Piper of change. And if you think of it, anything that's ever been accomplished in, man, in the history of mankind was because somebody went out and started with an idea. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was so attractive that others followed. Yeah. So what happened after they were playing your game? So then, then I, I got to meet uh, uh, Steven Spielberg for the first time and he's like, what do you want to do? And I go, well... You happen to have a property that I think would make a great video game, and uh, my kids love it, and I love it. It's called Animaniacs, and and go sure. And uh, it was a whole different dynamic than working with the studios before, because every time Warner's, which actually owned the copyright, said no, we don't want you to do this, we don't want you to do that. I go, uh, do I have to call my partner? And they go, no, 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 you can do it. <laughs> There's also an interesting story about how you got a meeting with David Geffen. How? Yeah. So 
So we were working with Microsoft. We created the first video on a computer, and Microsoft was the end all to end all, um, biggest company, and, and, and Bill Gates was the richest man in the world. And I realized that this technology would work better with music videos, but I didn't know anybody in the music industry. I didn't know how to do that. So I thought, what if I could get, this before everybody had email, what if I could get Bill Gates just to write a letter of introduction to David Geffen. If you get a letter from the richest man in the world telling you to meet somebody, I'm pretty sure you'll take the meeting. Um, perfectly makes sense, very valid thing to do. I don't know Bill Gates. Um, that was the missing piece of that story. <laughs> um, but I was working with Microsoft on the stuff and I knew that if I could make Windows cool and video for Windows cool, it would help them hit their numbers. Mm -hmm. I knew somebody there and uh, there was this nice woman in charge of video for Windows uh, uh, named Melinda. Um, and what I didn't know, and here's the luck and the kismet of life, mm -hmm. is she was dating somebody back then. Um, she is now Mrs. Bill Gates. Mm -hmm. um, so somehow this letter then goes out uh, to David Geffen, and that's how I ended up partnering and getting into the, the music biz. Yeah. And Jay, what I like your thought process is you always go to the end result, even if you're and not work sure. backwards. Yeah, and work backwards. Like I need Bill Gates to write a letter to David Geffen, and then you just and work. then and then you start visualizing how what steps. Right. Like, if you think about it, any doctor you've been to did the same thing. To be a doctor, he knew we had to go to med school. To get to med school, he knew we had to get good grades. It was a very linear path. Mm -hmm. Most of us can't connect the dots, and yeah. and. I remember I actually started thinking this way when I was in college. Uh, I was one of the editors of, of our college paper at UCLA, and so all these celebrities came to campus, big political figures, movie stars and everything, Bob Hope and, and Gene Wilder and all these people. And I would sit down and interview them because I wanted to find out, okay, at some point you were where I am now. Right. How did you get from here to there? What's that, what's that path? Because we go from right. seventh grade to eighth, ninth to tenth, da -da, and there isn't a path. Right. And that's what people have to understand. You have to blaze your own trail. Yeah. Who is your favorite person that you interviewed? Um, the one that, that's, well, one of my heroes in life was Doug Henning. So getting to meet Doug was, was, was amazing, a, a famous magician. Uh, mm. Gene Wilder wrote me this, this thank you note that I still have, have, have somewhere that it was the best biography of him ever done. I mean, it was just really just amazing. Yeah. And you start realizing that these aren't magical, special people with special powers. Right. They are people that put themselves out there and right. risk failing. Yeah. I like what you said that line, it's almost the linear path to disruption is kind of going to the end result and working backwards. You know, working backwards isn't going to be like a near, linear path, but that's kind of the thought process behind it. And Reed Hoffman, who everybody knows as, as for starting LinkedIn, but he also was PayPal and, and, and first money into Zuckerberg's yeah. hand and everything. He has a great expression that a, a real entrepreneur jumps off the cliff and assembles the plane on the way down. <laughs> and, right. and that's really what it is because once you take the leap, there's no turning back. Mm -hmm. You'll do whatever it takes yeah. and you may crash, but yeah. you learn a lot. Yeah. And you ended up then selling Jasmine. Yeah. So sold that, um, should have sold it earlier, had many offers that I was too young to understand. And when you're in your 20s and very successful, you know everything and you're the smartest man in the room. Um, so people wanted to take me public. Somebody wanted to give me a third of their company, which would have translated to $6 billion. Um, I didn't know any of that. Uh, so when I now mentor young entrepreneurs, when I sit on boards and stuff, I can tell them not because I always got it right, but because I have more scars on my back than most. Yeah. So when you sell it, then you become an entrepreneur, right? Yes. So, so I want to talk about that transition. So all my three straight gigs in life were going to very large companies, Universal Studios, one of the you know, biggest Hollywood studios, right. EMI, the world's largest music company, and Sony, the largest consumer electronics company, to change the company. Yeah. And so in, in the case of the two media companies, they had to figure out how to get in the digital age, you know, how to get on the internet, what to do, you know, what's their future. In the case of Sony, it was they had all these divisions that made different stuff. A Walkman does this, a Bio does this, a TV. The idea that they all have to ta talk and interconnect, which is now common sense, mm -hmm. was alien to the politics of a giant corporation. Right. So learning how to 
the advantages of an entrepreneur is you have the deep pockets of a corporation right. and the branding and the awareness. The downside is you're fighting an entrenched battle over turf. Right. So most people at big companies are not trying to say, how can I make the company better? How can I make yeah. more money? How can I be successful? They're interested in one thing, and that is self-preservation. Keeping their job. Plain and simple. Yeah. So if to anybody listening, if you want a practical tip, and it took me over a decade to learn this, I would walk in to pitch Intel, and I've got the greatest solution for Intel. I can do this for Intel. I can make Intel money, you know, or Ford or whatever. Wrong. Figure out what the motivation is for that person across the desk. Mm. I can get you a promotion. Mm. I can get you more turf. I can make you look good to your boss. I can, you know, help you survive. That's how you close a sale. Mm, I love that. Yeah. So what was an interesting motivation that you saw someone else had because you took the time to, to figure it out? Um, you can quickly see that there are certain divisions that wish they could get control of another division and kill them or make the other, you know, make part of their own company fail. Mm. That's a very common motivation. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. It happens all the time. And I name names, but we're recording this. Right. No, um, no names. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that there is a are weird motivation. Yeah. There's, there's, there's people that want to get noticed in their company. So mm -hmm. uh, a, a common example, especially in the digital space, is you're, you know, of the generation that lives on the internet and is connected and understands social media, and the CMO doesn't and could care less, but has to do something in digital. Mm -hmm. So you'll get noticed in the Wednesday marketing meeting because they're doing this little thing, mm -hmm. and you know, on a feature film like a Jurassic Park that would have you know a forty million dollar marketing budget. They're going to spend a hundred grand on the internet, um, but you could get noticed for that hundred grand. Right. And you, so it's it's finding those people that want to you know get noticed as opposed to yeah. duck and cover and and go for that that mythical gold watch after twenty years. Mm. You know I talk about it at length, but that idea that security robs ambition, it's really the illusion of security that robs ambition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That you know most of those big companies will not survive. Of the Fortune five hundred, this is the the 60th anniversary of that term, only 57 have survived as Fortune 500 companies. Wow. So if you've got the great job at the big company, it's not going to be there for you to retire. So Jay, what's your favorite story from the Universal Studios days? Uh, I know what my favorite story is. I'm not go going there. Um, really? Why? This was at a time when executives were dictating emails to their secretaries. Mm -hmm. So trying to explain to people, so I just had hired uh, and created the first auction on the internet and, and this morphed into what we know as, as eBay. Yeah. And I'm getting there and like you're all excited, you're part of a giant studio, you have your golf cart, you have a big title and all this stuff. And I realized at the end of every picture, they just pay a guy $5,000 to take away whatever props this, the, and just destroy everything and sell it. And I said, what if you auction these things off on the internet not so much that you're going to make a bunch of money, but it's free publicity that, you know, mm. Jurassic Park's out or Flintstones mm. are out yeah. or Liar Liar's out or whatever. You're all about great ideas. Fantastic you, idea. Yeah. You couldn't get anybody. You could hear crickets in the room of, we're an entertainment company. Why are we on the internet? This makes no sense. Go bother somebody else, kid. Right. Um, and what years it took me to realize is, yes, I was absolutely right. And I used to, you know, bang my head against the wall going, why don't they get it? It's not their job to get it. It's your job to communicate right. in a way that those living in the past can understand it and embrace the future. Right. Um, I once went to one of the three biggest companies in the world when I was president of the division Universal for this brilliant idea to transform their, pro form their product, their product and product and partner elevator at the CEO's floor in Armonk, New York at their worldwide headquarters and I'm walking down the hallway and every desk has an IBM Selectrix on it, not a PC. And I'm like, this digital conversation is not going to go very far. <laughs> and I was right. So, you know, you can be too far ahead of the curve and that's yeah. called the bleeding edge. Yeah. No, I like in the book how you do, you do t tell stories about this and essentially you take responsibility for not communicating and not saying they just don't get it. So I like that aspect. It's like you can only really control yourself 
and how you communicate whatever the idea is. But you, you yeah. hit on a key, and I, and I tried to avoid using those words in, in the book, but it's all about you have to take responsibility. Everything in your life is a choice, yeah. okay? You always have a choice. Yeah. And you go, well, what if terrorists take over my plane and, and you know, it's going to crash? You have a choice. You can, you, it doesn't mean your choices are all good choices, right. but the guys in Pennsylvania on 9-11 said, we're going to die, but we're going to die with dignity and try to do something about it. So right. in every business decision, you have to say, how can I make it successful? What yeah. do I have to do? And yeah. there is always a positive outcome. Yeah. So go back to the eBay. Um, I mean, there's so many good stories but so that you say that so then how does it get to ebay oh they did the, the studio the studio you know was 10 years before anybody right. in hollywood used ebay for marketing right um we we partnered ebay was trying to get customers a, at the time and and you know we came up with this thing called summer camp for ebay where we went to swap meets and we put a school bus and if you would walk through the school bus you were handed a nice cold ice cream cone Okay, yeah. so everybody would go for their free ice cream at, at a big swap meet. But as you walk through, there were people explaining and signing up how to use the Internet, how to use eBay. What were you looking for at the swap meet today? Oh, an Indian motorcycle headlight from 1927. There's one for sale right now. It's only twelve dollars. People go, oh, my God. And what happened out of that summer tour is the average person on eBay at that time this is in the mid 90s uh, was 40 plus and would spend 45 minutes on the site when the average person on the internet was 20. Right, right. So there's always a way to solve things. Yeah, no, I bring that up because I know that you were doing something with the White House, right, alongside, which was, he wasn't the founder of them, but now was the founder of eBay, right? Well, so I had this idea when I sold my company, and I'm always trying to figure out how to give back. If I've been this fortunate, and I'm lucky to have whatever connections or skill set, yeah. Um, so when I started Jasmine, you have a lot more free time than you have people paying for your time. So every year I'd sit down with the crew and say, what's a pro bono project that we can do and work on together nice. and enjoy it and give back. And yeah. when I bump into people, it's those projects, designing museums or this or that, that everybody remembers and, and you don't remember what you got paid or this or yeah. that. So I started writing about, uh, there was a famous Supreme Court case, Brown versus School of Education, where the definitive answer was separate but equal. Right. You didn't have to integrate. Some people could have different schools, but they'd be equal. And sure. it was BS. All classrooms were not equal. But if we could get the internet into the U.S. schools, yeah. if every classroom had a computer, yes, yeah, some kids would just watch cats playing on the piano, but it would give the opportunity for that motivated person yeah. to learn anything, have up-to-date knowledge, up-to-date maps, whatever. Yeah. So I started writing and speaking about this, and then one day, out of the blue, you get a call from the White House, will you make this happen? I go, absolutely, Mr. President. You know, oh my God, I can't believe I'm at the White House. Um, it was original opening of the book of, I had a ton of uh, iced tea before that meeting, and I'm sitting there through the whole meeting, just going, are you allowed to go to the bathroom? <laughs> Do you have to raise your hand at the White House? Please <laughs> do. Um, I'm like, just keep it together, Jay. You're with the most powerful <laughs> person in the universe, and you're acting like an idiot. Um, but to make a long story short, uh, President Clinton and, and Vice President Gore empowered us to try to do this, and with one catch, there wasn't a single dollar of taxpayer money available. Mm. So I was trying to say, well, what do charities do to raise money? Well, charities get people to donate stuff and have an auction. Why don't we just do that on this new medium, the internet, where I can get tons of corporations to donate stuff, Microsoft, Sony, everybody, da, 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 and then we'll raise the money. Well, no one had ever done an auction on the internet, so we found Pierre, and Pierre wrote the code, and it didn't go as smoothly as it should, but from that, he figured out how to solve the trust issue, uh, and that's why he became a billionaire. How did you know Pierre was the person to call at that time. Uh, so, so you have to understand that the internet at that time was probably by, being used by a thousand people. Mm -hmm. So if you put something up on the internet, there was somebody that would respond. Right. Just like when Bill Gates started on email, he would answer any email that came in. Like It wasn't like you had to go through a bunch of people. And today it's not much different in that you can pretty much identify and find 
anybody on LinkedIn or through social and have a direct contact. I talk about, you know, uh, a gal who, who just tweeted to Richard Branson and she was a high school dropout, had a decent idea and Richard gave her a million dollars for her company. Um, outcome and update, book update, uh, she sold the company, mm -hmm. everybody made money and she's on to her next one. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's really about looking at the end state. You know, I talk about making your disruptors map of, of where you want to go. And, and a career is much like going on a trip. It's just a longer trip with a lot more baggage. If you're going to Hawaii, you're not packing the lawnmower. You're not packing your ski park. Uh, you know, you're not packing any of that stuff. You're saying, what are those things that I need? Oh, I want to go snorkeling. I don't have a snorkel. Well, you want to achieve something and go, I don't have that piece. You can either learn it, you can hire it, you can rent it, you can get advisors. Yeah. It's that, it's that simple. So, Jay, what was the call like when you got a call from the White House? Um, well, you, you'd like to hit all the times I, I embarrass myself in life because I am that idiot that's successful. Um, my assistant at the time I don't goes, think this is uh, embarrassing at all. Because the, pres the president's on the phone. And I'm like, the president of what? You know, I figure it's president of some company. No, the president. So I pick up the phone and, and it's somebody doing a, hello, Jay, Sam, it's some, some, you know, Arkansas lousy accent. And I'm like, okay, who is this that, uh, you know, you know, this is like a really bad impersonation. <laughs> I, I don't have time for this. And the president of the United States, the most powerful man on the planet has to prove to you that it's actually him. Um, so that was kind of weird. Uh, and uh, it was just getting invited to the White House and yeah. you just get totally the sense of, wow, I am being empowered to try to change the world. Yeah. What led me to, to that state? Yeah. How could somebody else do this? So the first third of the disrupt you is how to change yourself to open yourself up for success. Yeah. The second third is how to look at any business differently and capture that value. And the third is if your financial needs are met and that doesn't motivate you, how to apply this to solving any of the world's problems, climate change, water, starvation, whatever it is. And some of the amazing stories of, of people that said, how can I take the same process to take on drug lords? How can I do this to depose dictators? I mean, right. uh, you know, the part of the Arab Spring that got the least amount of attention is countries that had dictators for millennium overthrew them without a single bullet or anybody dying. Some of the countries were a little more violent and still going on, but there was peaceful overthrow by empowering people with social media. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. And you know, going back to disruption, you pioneered EMI's digital model. So yes. what were the, some of the things you did at that time? So let me take everybody back in the time machine. So it's uh, about the time of, or just before Napster and everything, and every record company was convinced that they could fight off this thing called the internet. Mm -hmm. Let's just ignore it, stop it, no music can go there, end of story. They were so anti-internet that, that uh, uh, Jeff Bezos at Amazon, Amazon was just selling books and he wanted to sell physical CDs, no digital rights, no downloads, no any of that, physical CDs, and every single record company shut them out. They wouldn't let him sell it. And a physical record store would charge you for end cap positioning, have refunds, all the stuff. This guy just wanted full wholesale, no strings, whatever. And I'm like, I'm breaking this boycott. This is silly. Here's a guy who wants to sell our stuff. He's got the most customers of anybody. Hmm. Why wouldn't we? And once you open yourself to try anything, so we knew digital would change. And back before broadband, the only thing that fit through the pipes was music. So my word out to the industry was anybody come in and see me if you have an idea I haven't heard I'll try it it may work it may not uh, digital jukeboxes and ringtones and so at a time when we couldn't sell a single physical song for anything somebody came with the idea of selling 10 seconds of a song for a dollar mm. a ringtone for a phone but it was so easy one click and you'd get it on your phone 1.6 billion dollars in revenue the first year Wow! you couldn't That's you couldn't sell amazing. a song couldn't get anybody to buy an album, but you suddenly invent this new product. Yeah. And and a highlight, I'm trying to give you stuff that wasn't in the book. A highlight from that mm -hmm. time was, so I had all these great acts and worked with 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 all of them to get their rights and make it happen and everything. Yeah. You know, from the Sinatra estate and the Beach Boys and 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 David Bowie and Pink Floyd and everyone. But the Beatles, no. The Beatles 
wouldn't say yes to anything. They had their own, in, you know, internal divorce. If, if 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 one liked it, the other didn't, and there was no way to get anything through. Until one day, I pitched them something that had bothered them since they were the lads in Liverpool. And when they were growing up and they were poor, every bar had a jukebox. And the jukebox, when you put in your, your coin in the jukebox, half the money went to the bar owner and half went to the person that owned the jukebox. Mm. The musician got nothing. And this bothered them. Yeah. So a guy came up with the idea of what if you have a coin op jukebox in bars, but instead of it having records, it's hooked to the internet so you could have a million songs to choose from. And they go, we love it. And now the artist would get paid. And so mm. out of all the deals, they turned down a deal for 100 mil. They turned down tons of deals. They finally said, we'll do this, Jay. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm so happy. I'm a huge Beatles fan. I got them to say yes. And Neil Aspinall, the manager, goes, um, but they're still not completely sure. So they're only going to put five of their songs into this new medium called the Internet. I go, that's great. That's great. Which five? Jay, you get to pick. Wow. And that was just like the coolest, coolest thing, like as a fan to get to, you know, make something happen that's amazing you know it also brings up it seems like you're always kind of like ahead of the curve which has it's great but it also you're forging a new path and talk about animal animal house i think it was oh yeah so the way that you're i accurately predict the future is i hang out with the people that are coding it so mm -hmm. you know what's coming next, right? right? The Internet of Things, you know, 3D printing, autonomous vehicles. These aren't secrets. Um, but Animal House was, was a different one. So I'm here at Universal. I, they basically bought my mind because I built one of the biggest game companies. And they realized, we want to go into video games. This makes sense. And that became a, a multi-billion dollar division. Uh, but I'd been doing games for years. I'd done 300 of them. I was, like, gamed out. Um, and... Uh, I wanted to get more involved in this new thing, the web. And so I'm trying to figure out how do I convince my day job that this is something that they should do. And I'm like, wait a second, who's going to embrace the internet, young people? They're going to want to get their own email address, not their parents. We invented what we're doing. We invented voice over IP uh, 10 years before Skype. Um, and we said, wow, everybody goes to college. Colleges didn't have email addresses yet. What if we become the unofficial college website? So the college website would say, here's your major, and here's the building, and the history of 1792, and this would be, here's the cool bars in the neighborhood, here's, you know, everything that you need, uh, everything you need to get laid. So <laughs> I, I knew this would work, but I couldn't figure out how to sell it. So I'm going through, I'm, I'm president of the division of Universal, I'm in charge of digital, and I go, aha, we're coming up on the 20th anniversary of their highest grossing comedy film ever, Animal House. If we name this college site Animal House, then I could convince people that this is important for them to sell mm. VHS copies for the anniversary. Right, right. When in fact, we got one out of five college kids to join the first year. Oh. It became a huge social network until one day, basically, my bosses are like, why are we on the internet? Shut it down. So why'd they shut it down? You know, my, my mom uh, raised me not to say things that aren't nice. Um, they didn't get it there was there was nobody seeing the internet as a medium for making money mm -hmm. uh the idea that we could amass the largest young people audience that would then buy their music go to the movies watch the tv shows yeah. and all those various things everything that seems common sense today yeah when there's only 10 million households that have a computer right the other you know 200 plus million people are like what are you doing yeah because at that point there were millions of people on animal house right uh, we, we hit a million people in about six months, which wow. was amazing considering there's only five million college kids. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but the average 50-year-old that was running a division of a major corporation in mid-1990s wasn't on the internet, yeah. wasn't using email, and had no idea what we're talking about. Yeah. Matter of fact, just to put in perspective, uh, the number one e-commerce site back then on the whole internet was a company called Kona Coffee out of Hawaii. And you're going, huh? Because people didn't know what the internet was, so a reporter wrote about a store that you could buy their coffee beans from. Mm. And so many people wrote that story in so many publications that everybody went and bought their coffee beans. Um, it wasn't that the internet made them successful, it was all the press that went around it. I so, so I yeah. talk about 
import, the importance of earned media yeah. and, and how that's so key today. Yeah. So, Jay, when does the Pope come into the picture? Oh, um, so uh, short version, uh, the Catholic Church was worried that they were losing a generation to computers and video games. And, and how do you reach in this new medium? Remember, uh, religion had figured out how to have, you know, programming on television, uh, but they couldn't figure out the thing. And... Uh, I required everybody in my company to answer tech support calls and we get a tech support call one day and while you're waiting for the guy to reboot you want to just talk to him and I even I as the CEO you know uh, took calls and this guy uh, I think his name was Timothy was on the phone and, and he, I said what do you do he goes I'm a father I go I'm a father too I've got two kids he goes I'm a Jesuit I'm like, <laughs> what's that make a long story short Worked in the IT at a place called the Vatican. When you stop to think about it, I, you know, to think of the Vatican as this old thing, but it's got to have an IT department. You're running a billion plus people and, right. and billions and billions of dollars. So I said, you know, I've always wanted to do a CD-ROM about the art collection, about the, you know, everything in that library. And, you know, put it out there in the universe. Suddenly you get some phone calls. The next thing you know, You've got, you know, Peter Ustinov recreating scenes of Galileo. You've, you've got every photo of every piece of art. You have the Pope's Choir doing the history of Western music. Right. Uh, and you're guaranteed with a bestseller when you have 600 Catholic dailies around the world and magazines that give you free ad space. Wow. And uh, my, my favorite headline, I think it was either Variety or Hollywood Reporter, had a headline, uh, CD Rome. Uh, exactly. Pope, yeah, I this. love that. Um, <laughs> That's great. And, and uh, you know, very, very fun. And, and Robin Leach, I don't know if you're too young to remember. No, Robin of Leach. course. Lifestyles you know, of the Rich and Famous. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, I made it my answering machine for a while. But in, in that episode, it goes, and Jayon Samet has the answer. The Pope. <laughs> um, you know, what's next in technology? Uh, you know, I don't say these things to brag. I say these things because I'm no different than every person that took the time mm. and the energy to try to improve themselves yeah. by listening to your show. Yeah, and yeah. before I forget, let me give a gift to everybody that gave the gift of their time today. Yeah. There is a 40-page workbook that goes along with this book that, that I created to help you take your notes and help you in your personal transformation. Yeah. If anybody reaches out to me on Twitter at jsamet, at my website jsamet.com, my email, however you want to reach me, I will send you that 40-page workbook for free. Nice. Thank you. So that Very people generous. can get more, more out of the book. The book is... Nobody does a book to make money. You know, it's 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 a labor of of of, of love. Of it's my back, way yeah. Yeah. of helping other people do it in less time. Maybe I learned some shortcuts mm -hmm. or a different way of thinking. Yeah. So Jay, what? And it's, yeah. Go on. You, you read it and you listen to it. It's practical stuff. This isn't. Yeah. You know, weird psycho babble. Right. No, it is, and it's you know each story. You can draw a lesson on how to use it for whether you're an employee in a company or you have your own business. Um, what what story didn't make the book? Because obviously a lot gets on the chopping block. Um, what are some of your favorites that when you look back that uh, didn't make it? There, there, there's so many projects that should have happened that didn't. Mm -hmm. So I fail more than anybody that you'll ever meet because I try right. nonstop. Right. And so all your greatest things that should have happened and yeah. you should have tried and da da da. Uh, yeah, what are some I, I of those? That's of, a good one. Yeah, I, I'll give you some some great ones. So yeah. when we're early making the first multimedia computers and stuff, remember nobody's on the internet yet. It's 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 a it's a weird way of just there's no web. There's no Mark Andreessen hadn't put a, a face on it. And I'm sitting there like, wow, I got to wait for this FedEx package to come with like ten thousand pages of documents from IBM so we can do work and continue. I'm like, what if we come up with a thing and we call it digital mailman? Like we figure out how to connect people and give them a unique email. So we thought up this concept of email and it just didn't make it to the top of the list. I mean, the number of things that, that you know are, are going to happen and change the world, you can't do them all once, once you do them. Uh, you know, so there were a ton of those, you know, where you just put it all together. And I'll give you one that was that was really personal and 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 transformative. So it was one of the pro bono projects. So they were designing the Holocaust Museum for Washington D.C. Hmm. And 
everybody, you know, probably the, the, the fastest fundraiser ever, you know, everybody donated and amazing architecture and this or that. But they had a challenge. And the challenge was you have inner city D.C. school kids coming. You have survivors of the camps. You have their children. You have modern day Germans. You have a wide range. How do you tell the story mm. in a way that is accessible to everybody, regardless of age, culture or language? Yeah. And so and the second part of their challenge to us was we're historically going chronologically through the 30s and 40s. So there's no technology that you can really use in this museum. So make a long story short, what we came up with was, and they don't still do it because it slowed down uh, traffic, but it was really a powerful thing. When you walk into the museum, there were two sets of bins for men and women by age of passports. Hmm. And the passport would have a picture of an actual human being. I was there. I actually went through when they, when they did this. Yeah. Yeah. And the story before the war and the only visible technology was we put a little barcode on the back. And as you went through the checkpoints of the museum, you held up your thing and it printed out the next page. And the inspiration was, I still cannot understand 80 million people dying in the war or 6 million people right. dying in the Holocaust. Right. But I can relate to one person like me. Yeah. So a small child would go through and say, My, you know, I got a brother. He's always beating me up and I hate taking piano lessons. And as you go through, I'd only like to know, is my brother alive? Mm. And for 15% of the passports, they were survivors. And you'd go in this, this marble room that had video displays and you could hold up your passport and see now as an old person, mm. that actual person that you experienced That's that amazing. journey with, telling you what happened with their life. Yeah. It was very powerful. Yeah. So, so the ability to really, you know, apply what you've learned, what you have a skill at to make an impact on others. Too many times we get lost on that impact has to be just financial. Yeah. If you're passionate about what you're doing, you will find a way to make a living. Yeah. But if you're passionate about something, share that passion and, and disrupt the world. Yeah, that's an amazing story. The reason I'm doing this interview with you, or interviews in general, is because my grandfather was a Holocaust survivor, and I remember watching his interview with the Holocaust Foundation, and it really touched me. So, yeah, thanks for that. Is amazing. It goes back to that one person that's affected, and it's so yeah. powerful. Yeah. And I'll give you a, a positive one. that's on the other side. So yeah, um, not a depressing one. Of if is the uh, person you're holding up going to die? Yeah. So they decided that Ellis Island and Statue of Liberty was worn down and all this, and they did a whole redo and a whole redo and laser discs being part of the museum and everything. And great stuff. But the one thing that I got to put in that museum that touched me was my grandfather, who came from Eastern Europe as a little boy in, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, told me a story that as a little boy, he got off the boat and he'd heard all the stuff, but he didn't know what America would be. Is this bad? Is it scary? This or that. And they handed him a banana. And if you came from Eastern Europe, you'd never seen a yellow fruit like this. And it tasted so good. He knew life would be sweet in this country. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so when you go through the museum that we did at Ellis Island, there's all kinds of stuff that you can touch a suitcase and hear this story, this and see the video of the thing. But there's a, just on the wall, there's this banana. And it just seems like incongruous to everything else that you possibly place. Yeah. have to do. But when you touch it, you hear an actor, a, a little boy actor, telling my grandfather's memory. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Holy yeah. cow. And that's still there. Like if I go there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That is so cool. I love that. You know, your sons. I want to talk about your sons. You know, because okay. the biggest thing is, you know, what do you teach them about disruption? They're two successful young men, right? So where, what are they up to that's exciting? And tell me about some of the uh, things that you did that you instilled on them early on. Well, I can't take credit. They're, they're amazing young men, yeah. uh, very successful, very creative, uh, did everything right. But I tried to show as an example as a father, not that I was – flawless and father knows best and, and this big thing, mm -hmm. but that I made mistakes, yeah. that I failed, that I tried, that I went out there and, you know, I would also then, you know, take them with me to explore all these things. Yeah. And I remember at one of the first national eBay conventions, uh, one of my sons was in junior high school and I took him with me 
and very bright uh, uh, Danny. And he went around to interview all these people that were successful with businesses on eBay mm. to try to understand what they did and, right. and, and disrupt in his own mind. Right. And what he took away his lessons are if you sell one item, somebody else could sell the same item and then everybody knows the price and you won't be. So you got to bundle things together. Mm. And you have to bundle things together that you normally couldn't find somewhere. And he came to me and says, Dad, I'm going to launch my own eBay business. And I go, this is tremendous. What are you going to do? Remember, he's in junior high. Martial arts weapons. Uh, <laughs> what? And, and, and I'm sure he would kill me today because I doubt if anybody in the professional world knows. So, so he contacted manufacturers and they would drop ship direct to the purchaser. Wow. So he's never, he's never touching anything. Yeah. He's just making an offering of two throwing stars and a knife or whatever it was. And he instantly was making money. And the only difference was once he had proved the concept, yeah. Money had no relationship to his life, so he got bored and just stopped. But he proved that he could make a successful business mm. by just deconstructing how to do it. Right. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. What's another one that you encouraged them or business they started that you were, were overseeing? Uh, I was making video games, and yet we didn't have the state-of-the-art game system in the house. We didn't. I didn't let them. And it wasn't that I was being a hypocrite. It's I believed if you want to use a computer, learn how to use it. And if you can learn how to, so they know how to code. The old man doesn't. Um, they speak a bunch of languages. I don't. You know, I realized what I missed out. Hmm. And my mistake in education was I wanted to please my parents, which meant getting an A. So my focus in school was what do you have to do to get the A mm. as opposed to what can I learn? Right. So by the time you, you morph that to college, it's how do you take the Mickey Mouse, Mouse classes that you'll learn absolutely nothing for the least amount of effort but be guaranteed to get an A so you can go into graduate school. Mm -hmm. Whereas what they did is they learned to love learning. Yeah. And How'd you do that though, Jay? Outcome. How'd you do that? How'd oh. you get them to learn to love learning? Uh, I was blessed that they went to schools and teachers. I really can't take credit for, mm. for anything in their success. Uh, you know, spend a lot of time with kids. They're mm. sponges. Throw everything out at them, and you don't know what sticks. I didn't try to make them become mini-me's, uh, yet things that are my personal passions rubs off. And I actually tried on the sports example that we talked about. I didn't want to have my bias, so I was the soccer coach right? And the little league coach, I knew nothing about these. Our teams never won anything except we always won best banner in the parade. Um, I, I was the, the, the Cub Scout coach again, you know, didn't know how to do any of the knots or start fires. But, you know, when they had the, the Pinewood racers, ours had the best paint jobs. Uh. You know, you were talking about the straight A's and pleasing parents. And it, I think you put out on a Twitter the quote, um, one of the Beatles quotes, about I can't remember what it was. It was about um, when the teacher asked him. Oh, John John Lennon. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. The teacher the teacher asked asked young John what do you want to be uh, when you grow up, and John said happy. And the teacher says I don't think you understand the assignment, and John said I don't think you understand life. Right. Um, yeah, my, my my dad was a was a public school math teacher, and the deal was if I would bring home an A, I would get a dollar. And if I got a B, I had to pay him $2. Mm, wow. I never got a B. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Uh, the rules were set. I ended up missing out on taking all the things I would have enjoyed to learn in college. Yeah. I was a poli-sci major because it was the least number of classes to get your degree. I cheated myself. So one of my sons went to Brown. And when he explained to me Brown has no grades and no required classes, I thought of Jay trying to get the A and going like, oh, no, 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 you, you're not going there. What he explained to me was what they'd set up, and it was Leon Panetta that invented it when he was a Brown student. They made a market-based economy. So for the English department to get funded to keep their professors, kids have to take English courses. If none are required, the only reason you would take that course is you heard it's an amazing class. Mm. Or the geology class or the stir class or this or that, as opposed wow. to, ooh, I hear you know, rocks for jocks is the easiest A. Yeah. I'm going to take that class. That's so amazing. every teacher is yeah. competing to get a student, right. which 
lifts the quality of the education and makes students want to take those classes. Yeah. It's mind blowing that you can disrupt the entire concept of how we do it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I had no idea. That's amazing. Um, you know, you've had amazing career jobs, companies. What's been the worst job? Ah, uh, worst jobs. Um, working at retail, working in, in a restaurant or something, something I believe everybody should because then you would learn how to treat those people a lot nicer. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, dealing with that. Um, oh, the, oh well, you really want stuff that isn't in anybody else's stuff. So there, there was a time when I absolutely need, needed money and I got to leave the name out. Um, you ever watch the TV show Ray Donovan? No, I didn't see that, no. Uh, so Ray Donovan's about uh, a, a muscle guy in, in Hollywood that, that fixes problems for studios and stuff. And it's based on a real guy who does private security and, you know, so make a long story short, I took a job helping him write and everybody's walking around with guns and everybody's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not a calm environment that I would normally be in. And so why are they walking around with guns? Because they do a lot of stuff to keep people safe and that they're hired because they'll do the stuff that cops won't. Got it. Got um, it. And... There's alarm systems that make the story very, very short. They're, he told if the alarm ever goes on and screw up or whatever, you know, just stand outside, driver's license between your teeth, your hands locked above your head, and, and because all hell's going to break loose, the sheriff's, the police, you know, uh, Secret Service, everybody. He provided the president's security. You know, he did the stuff that governments aren't allowed to. Yeah. So one day I screw up. The alarms go off. I'm standing out there, and I'm having this, you know, life moment where I'm saying, I'm a father of two small boys. There are people pointing guns at me. I'm standing with my driver's license between my teeth. I'm not showing up this job tomorrow. <laughs> um, uh, and yeah, he's, he's, uh, but it was, it was amazing. You know, I don't want to tell tales out, out of school, but you know, there, there's, there's stalkers there. There's, there's real bad people that if you follow the rules, you have to wait till they do something bad. Right. Uh, to, and so there's other good people that do bad things to prevent that. And right. uh, it was funny seeing this TV show that's either Showtime or HBO right now. It's a, it's a hit show. Um, Leave Shriver and uh, everybody. Uh, that's basically a fictionalization of, of this particular individual. So it's sort of like, I mean, I think I've seen like the Bounty Hunter like reality show, maybe something like that is similar. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's that type, type yeah, of thing. Yeah. Um, Jay, so... You also have had some encounters with Steve Jobs. Yes. What was that like? Um, Steve, you know, it's it's the the um, canonization of him since he's died is really interesting. Uh, Steve was both ends of the spectrum at once. He was a visionary who could micromanage, very unusual. He was, I will succeed at any cost or break any rule or be as vindictive or, you know, whatever. Uh, so had a number of, of different transactions over the years and three for three, he got the long end of the stick on all three times. Anything interesting about any of those that would be fun to tell? Lots of great ones to tell with, uh, out an audience and, and, and I, see. I see, I see. Um, <laughs> You know, since it's inspired Insider, Jay, I always like to ask, um, what's been the lowest point? And then how do you uh, push through the tough times? So being an entrepreneur nowadays, you have crowdfunding, you have VCs, it's an established thing. Yeah. Going back 30 years ago, not so much so. Uh, it, it was a new world. It wasn't guaranteed that everybody was going to go into high tech. And so I funded my first company off of my credit cards. Probably the worst thing you can do, you know, 20, 30% interest rates, penalties, the whole bit. And the lowest moment was when the guy rings your doorbell to repossess your car. Mm. And you're like, I need my car. I, da, 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 da. And the humanity of that person to, you know, give me a break, mm. you know, so that I could continue. Uh, you know, you sometimes bet the farm yeah. and you take risks and sometimes you take risks that you shouldn't. And so part of... The reason for doing Disrupt You is to show people other alternatives to putting themselves in that level of jeopardy yeah. that they might not have imagined. 
you know, I talk a lot about OPM in the book, other people's money. Right. But there are people that will give a startup money that don't want any of your equity and don't want the money back. Yeah. And it's because your startup can help them solve their problem. And so, yeah, no, it, it's not all, it's not all, ooh, happy days, you know. Right. Everybody, everybody looks at, at the Michael Jordan, you know, you know, slam dunk, and everybody looks at Tiger Woods and the hole in one. Right. What they're not seeing yeah. is the ten thousand hours yeah. of, of trying that it takes. Yeah. Uh, but uh, if somebody really wants to hear this this speech and this story, I was the commencement speaker at a college graduation. It's yeah. up on YouTube. I listened to that. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. And what came out of the story was every one of my college friends that refused to give up. Yeah. They all had insane dreams, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, the, the, the least attractive gal and theater arts major wanting to be a, a star. And she's ended up making more money than any of the pretty faces people know. I mean, just every single one made it to the top. And it wasn't like, wow, this was the extraordinary class and the planets aligned and you know, we were all named Rockefeller or something. Right. This was just, if you don't give up. Grinding it out. If you embrace failing and learn from each step, yeah. you'll make it. Yeah. That's what I love about talking to people like you and hearing this because it's a reminder of, you see them on the cover of Forbes or Inc. or whatever, but what it took to get there were all those trying and failing and learning to get to that point. They didn't just end up there you know, after a year, it's like that 20 year success overnight type of thing. Yeah. And I talk about how to get those big ideas and, and how to, you know, generate the, the zombie idea that can't be killed. And, and there's so much change right now that there are whole areas that nobody has laid a stake on, that you could be the best of the world, that we know the world's going there. It's much like the railroads coming from the East Coast to, to San Francisco. Okay. You know, if you buy the land in the middle, you're going to get to sell it to a railroad company. Well, we know what the end state is. You don't have to invent technology. This isn't about just tech businesses. You could do a restaurant. You could do a clothing line. It's about deconstructing the value chain, capturing the value, yeah. understanding how real business works, not some theory that they teach at MBA schools that involves graphs and charts and BS. Yeah, yeah. And, and I encourage anyone to get disrupt you because there's the practical stuff you're talking about is almost teaching people how they come up with ideas. Like I like you give a lot of examples. I won't go through all of them, but the design one where, you know, Kate Spade didn't invent the purse. They designed it. So you can look at that in any industry. You know, some of the things you're talking about, you can just apply that one concept of design and apply it to any industry or one concept to any of the industries. So I really encourage people to, to check it out. You know, it just makes you think differently. Terrific. Um, on the flip side, Jay, what's been the proudest moment? Proudest moment. Um, you know, when we hit that point from, from net day and, and the netathon and everything, that every classroom in the United States was hooked up to the internet. Mm -hmm. And that that only took 18 months and not one dime of taxpayer money. Mm. Yeah. That was an amazing feeling. Uh, when, you know, each time you come up with a wacky idea and it actually happens, you know, uh, I remember sitting in the back of the of the plane when we did the concert at at thirty thousand feet with with Sheryl Crow, you know, the most audacious, insane PR stunt idea ever, and I'm just sitting there kind of like, yeah, we pulled this off. I mean, it, it's you know, remember to celebrate what you have. The the biggest mistake yeah. entrepreneurs make is they constantly, they grind it every day and they see how far in the future that goal is. Yeah. Stop for a second and look over your shoulder and you'll realize how far you already came. Right. You know, people don't tend to measure that. Yeah. You know, as far as you shoot for the stars, the stars will always be outside of reach. Okay? Right. But, but as long as you're shooting for them, you're getting a lot farther than, you know, this country was, was pioneered by, by pioneers and, and then settled by settlers. And I try to tell people, stop settling and, you know, go be a pioneer, go explore. So Jay, what was the scene like on that plane? Just describe it for people. When you sat back and you're like, wow. 
Uh, so, so the backstory was we were launching a digital download service that needed a PR stunt. What if you could use frequent flyer miles to get songs and all that? And United was coming out of bankruptcy and they needed the thing. And so I had this idea, what do we fill a plane with press, have Sheryl Crow perform a concert, shoot it with nine cameras, edit it on laptops in first class, give everybody a DVD so we can make the evening news. And it all sounds so simple. And Ty Braswell and my team that, that made it all happen. By the time we get to that moment, I'm just sitting. There's, there's nothing for me to do except watch it unfold as you imagined it or better than you imagined it. Yeah. Um, you know, the little things of, by the way, when you change altitude, the strings on a guitar change and this or that. So making an instrument tuned to at altitudes is, is a whole thing. Not something all you those think little, about. Yeah. yeah, all those little details and stuff. And, you know, would all this equipment interfere with the equipment of a plane and then everybody crashes and dies? So United was required by FAA to, to do a test run with yeah. just my employees. You know, I'm like, <laughs> you guys don't have to do this. Uh, just, you know, how to do it. How do you let people take when word leaks out that there's going to be this amazing flight? How do you stop other people from buying tickets on that flight? And nobody could figure out because, you know, the scheduled flight and the plane and everything, they have this massive software. They're not going to change the whole software for us. Yeah. And I'm like, well, you know, every seven years, you know, Tuesday the 1st is Tuesday the 1st. So let's just go seven or 14 years in the future and tell everybody to book their ticket on that flight in 14 years and just put this flight's canceled and then switch it the day of. I mean, all kinds of fun little tricks, but it was cool. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, okay. So, Jay, w we've talked about a lot of things. What should we leave people with as far as advice or thoughts moving forward on Disrupt You? So let me get on a soapbox for two seconds. Go ahead. When we look at Ferguson, Baltimore, the problems in Greece, ISIS, these are not problems of race, religion, culture, nationality. These are massive unemployment for those under 30. There are not going to be corporate jobs for 2.3 billion millennials. There won't be corporate jobs in the U.S. for 80 million millennials. If we want society to be stable, if we want there to be a middle class, if we want to be able to live in, in, in peace and prosperity, we need to embrace an entrepreneurial spirit as a society, and we each need to do it as an individual and collectively solve problems. Mm -hmm. And that's what Disrupt You is all about. It is really taking Occupy Wall Street from I'm against all this to I'm part of the solution. And when you see what teenagers are doing today, what, what the slightest movement that people are able to create and do and the impact that they can have, if that doesn't inspire you, you know, I always ask audiences when I give, give speeches around, are you – uh, living life or just paying bills till you die. You know, to me, the purpose of life is to have a life of purpose, to figure out something that you want, some mark you want to make. It doesn't have to be, I built the Taj Mahal. It can be, I raised good kids or, you know, I cleaned up my local river, whatever that you're about. But mm. we, we have only one shot. Why not do the most with it that you can? And if Disrupt You can provide the inspiration, the motivation, the tools that you can apply to just get that much further, you know, rather than have $100,000 in student debt, you can spend $10 and hopefully change the outcome of your life. Yeah, 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 disrupt you. Where should people check it out? Where should they go? I have one last question, but tell people where they should check everything out. So it's in bookstores, it's online, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, anywhere that uh, your, your books are sold. It's available in, in audio with my voice. It's available in Kindle. It's available in Chinese, Korean, you know, yeah. wherever your, your audience reaches. Yeah, and they can go to jsamet.com. Also, he spent uh, two full days, over 24 hours, recording the Audible, so you better get it. It's, uh, it's great. Uh, my last question, Jay, is your favorite magic trick and um, you've been a magician for for how many years well oh, since I was four years old so yeah so uh, uh, half a century uh, I love magic because and, and let me explain why and why it ties into why I think I've been successful as a career that's how I paid my way through college so oh, really? it's still something yeah. something that I perform and enjoy when you go see a singer you want them to sing their best yeah. when you go see a dancer you want them to jump their highest and, and have their best when you go to see a magician, you want them to fail. 
You want to figure it out. Yeah, yeah. It's the only art form where the audience is against the performer. Yeah. You want to laugh at the comic. Right. You want to see the magician fail. So if you can overcome an audience that is always against you, hmm. changing the I never culture, thought about it a like business, that. making a million dollars, that uh -huh. stuff's easy. Uh -huh. Going into a boardroom with a, yet another PowerPoint, eh, I'm doing tricks every day. Uh, so, you know, so, you know, I, I, I love that ability and I love that when there's a kid crying on a plane, I can get him laughing in two seconds by, you know, just putting something in my ear and have it come out my nose. Um, <laughs> You know, there. I don't know if this works on Skype, but there you go. Or the Hollywood version. <laughs> uh, but you know, that's that's what I've always enjoyed. So for me, that's yeah. that's my hobby and and what I spend time with. And as far as favorite trick, yeah. Uh, what are you know, some of your favorite yeah. ones that you were so proud that you mastered? Um, it's too long of a story, but I'll I'll, I'll do the short version. So yeah. there's an or, there's an organization called the Magic Castle. Yeah, and very famous. All, yeah, all, all the top magicians in the world, and you have to audition to get in. And so, in my twenties, it was my goal: could I get in? Could I be that level? Be good enough? But then you stop, and just as I break down every business, I looked at it the same way: I'm not going to do a trick they haven't seen. I'm not going to tell a joke they haven't heard. My hands are not going to be the best mechanic in the world of such skill and dexterity that they will marvel. So how are they going to pick me? Mm. So the only thing left as I started deconstructing it, the same way I teach a deconstruct business, was intellectual approach. Mm. What if I study the most famous routine that somebody did from a different era and, and show that I so appreciate the art that I do the routine identically, word for word, move for move. Wow. And so cup, cups and balls is the oldest magic trick known. And the definitive performer was a contemporary of Houdini named Di Vernon. Di Vernon mastered it. He does did the best routine. He was amazing. 1930s, nobody could beat him. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do Di Vernon's cups and ball routine exactly. Show up, Magic Castle, go in the basement. There's a bunch of magicians sitting around the table. And for the first time in his 92 years, as far as I know, Di Vernon decides to show up to be one of the oh judges. Oh, my God. <laughs> I had never shaken before or been nervous performing magic. So this could have gone one of two ways. Either this guy's ripping off my routine or this guy sucks compared to how I do it. Uh, I couldn't see a good way that this was going, but there was no backup plan. Uh, so six people auditioned that night and then you go and wait and they go, you, you, you. And then they call the other five guys in and I'm sitting there in the basement going like, really? You can't just like say something nice to me. You, you know, before I leave, like try again or something. Just have me sitting here, like whatever. And what I didn't know is they told the other five guys they didn't make it in, and then they called me in. But uh, you know, performing that trick for Die and yeah. you know, may you rest in peace was like really a, a validation of not so much my skill, but the critical thinking that goes into mm. trying to succeed at a goal. Yeah, yeah. So did he say anything, or did they just tell you you're in, or what do they what do they tell you? Yeah, we had some conversations and stuff. And, and, and to fast forward uh, this past year, uh, the two Samet boys individually each auditioned. And really? So they, so they did take, you know, being in my act when they were little and, and me dragging them to everything, it, it stuck, though I didn't force it upon them. And uh, one of them did a trick that the panel actually said to him afterwards, we don't know how you did it. Wow. We'd never seen it before. He really created something uh, original. So... Very, very proud that that tradition. What was it? Do you know? Um, Not you know how he did Boggle? it, but yeah. Do you know the, the game Boggle with the little... Sure, I love that game. Yeah. That yeah. So he's a Hollywood writer. He writes sitcoms and everything. And what he did, uh, a whole routine about writing and, and everything. And he had somebody do the old pick a card. And then he had Boggle. And he shook the Boggle. And when all the cubes fall in place, it then says the three of spades. Wow. The card that the person picked. Uh, that's amazing. Yeah, mind. -blowing. So, can you see some of his stuff on YouTube or anything? Or um, did they anything? does Benji have tricks up on YouTube? I I, I should know the answer uh, to that. I mean, he has he has other stuff up on yeah. YouTube. But, no. Jay, a lot of great. This has been absolutely fantastic. I could probably talk for hours about magic with you, but um, you're a busy man. So, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, and everybody disrupt, disrupt you. you. That's right. Have a good day. Bye. What I got, you can't buy.
It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach if you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand